while I was nine years old, the family moved to Burnaby, BC. That's where I really got connected with lacrosse. In those days, lacrosse was really, really popular. And kids would walk around with a lacrosse stick then, the way they walk around with a cell phone today. And so that gives you some idea on just how popular the game was. North Burnaby was a real hotbed for lacrosse. They had teams in every division, and they had kids playing house league, and it was really a progressive game. And uh, I got interested in it on the basis of uh, Val Roach. I don't know if any people remember him, but of course he was kind of a, an instigator of uh, a lot of sports in North Burnaby, soccer especially, and lacrosse. And uh, he would encourage kids to come and play. The more you played it, the more you had to play more sort of thing. And uh, so it kind of developed that I went through the house league. Then I went, was able to make a, one of the regular teams. And my career just progressed like through minor lacrosse in North Burnaby. And when uh, I became junior age, four or five of us moved over and tried out with the team in, in, uh, in, in, Renfrew, in the Renfrew area. And uh, luckily, I was able to catch on a spot for the team when it went through. And at that time, the coach was Jack McKinnon. Uh, I think a lot of lacrosse people know Jack really well. I played lacrosse for the junior team for three years, 1954, 55, and 56. And uh, at that time, we were fortunate to win two Minto Cups. In that particular year, we lost the first game of the season. and. And then after that, I think we won 55 straight games, which went carried us like through the 1954 season, and through the 1955 season. And uh, the game we lost was a Mental Cup game that we had to play in Winnipeg. Uh, at, that, at that time, the teams that traveled east and west, they always had to stop at Winnipeg to decide whether they should continue to, to the west coast or the east coast, or whether Winnipeg would continue the trip. So we played in Winnipeg, and uh, uh, we lost the first game. And I say that was the first time we'd lost in 55 games, if I remember serves me right. And we won the second game, and we lost the third game. And uh, uh, at that time, there were quite a few uh, hockey players. Actually, Winnipeg was the team was mostly hockey players, and some of them were really NHL players. In those days, they allowed. NHL players to play lacrosse or, uh, or you know, uh, contact games. Not nothing like it is today, but we ended up losing the, set, the third game, and uh, then we came back for the start of the next season, 1957 season, and uh, we ended up winning the Minto Cup at that time as well. Uh, the whole junior team virtually moved up to the senior Vancouver lacrosse team club, rather. And, uh, and from then, um, you know, just progressively played until I retired in 1968. Uh, keeping in mind that when we moved up from junior to senior, uh, the intention was that the junior players would replace some of the veterans on the Vancouver team that were retiring. And uh, when D-Day arrived, uh, we found that all of the so-called senior players that were going to stay in Vancouver, they transferred out. Most of them went to New Westminster. A couple of them went to the island. And the only player that stayed with us was Alfie Brenner. So what happened was we ended up with virtually a junior team with one senior player playing in the senior league. So we took our lumps. There's no question about it. Uh, you know, we're, you have kids playing against men and uh, the results were obvious. It was a total shock when you know, all the veteran players decided to up and leave, leave us. So as I said, we had to work through our lumps. And we, I don't think we won many games that year, maybe uh, one or two, I can't remember for sure. But as it turned out, uh, it was a good experience for us because you're thrown right into the fire. You, know, you didn't have this apprenticeship kind of program where you'd maybe play one or two games. And, try and learn from practicing and that sort of thing from the uh, experienced players. And um, every year we got a little bit better and a little bit better. And, uh, and finally, uh, you know, we melded into a fairly strong team. 
And uh, in 1960, uh, I think that was about the year we reached our best season of, since the day we started. And as it turned out, um, I think that was the year that uh, we lost to Nanaimo in the, f in the finals. And, and then that seemed to really kick off our success. The loss to them at that time uh, had our team really connected for the next three or four years. And uh, we ended up uh, being playing for the Man Cup in three of the next four years. But the thing too was in Nanaimo, we, uh, I think we got short shifted by, uh, by the, in the game. Uh, like in those days, they had a rule about shooting the ball. Like a lot of times when you're winning by one goal near the end of the game, you could hang on to the ball. In those days, there was no 30 seconds the clock rule. You could hang on to the ball. So if you had raggers that could kill the last three or four minutes of a game if you're ahead by one, with the other team never even touching the ball. So they introduced a rule where in the last two minutes or one minute, I can't remember exactly, where you had to have a shot on goal. And so the idea was when they said a shot on goal, it didn't necessarily mean a, a goal or a save by the goalie. It was just an attempt towards the goal. So like every team had to play, you shoot wide, so the ball rolls around the boards and down the floor so you maintain possession. And so in this particular game, uh, I think we were probably tied or down one goal. I can't really remember for sure. But as it turned out, uh, we scored a goal and they called it back because the one minute had expired. And uh, this really upset us because when we thought about it or looked at the situation, like in the penalty box, there was a guy sitting in the penalty box and nobody knew what he was there for, but he was the one that decided that we didn't have that shot in the last minute. So it was that kind of situation really, you know, really hurt us. Uh, we felt that, you know, we were unjustly lost. And I think that made a big difference in our, our attitude to how we were going to end up playing the game in future years. We weren't going to let those kinds of situations override the fact that we were going to always play at our best and always try to win every game. Every game you play, you play to win all the time and, and you try to exhibit good sportsmanship and everything that goes along with it. And uh, I think it's just the fact that everybody was so disappointed in losing to uh, Nanaimo that, uh, that I think they just kind of made up their minds that that was the last time we we're going to lose. This, I'm just supposing that. And, uh, and I think that's basically what happened. The same guys, if you look at pictures of uh, the Land Cup teams, they're virtually the same guys. You know, Fred Usselman, Alec Carey, Bill Chisholm, Bob Perry. Uh, actually, Stan Josephs was our goalie for a while before he moved over to New Westminster. And Alfie Brenner, of course, that I mentioned. And uh, uh, Charlie Boucher. And uh, John Servi, of course. Uh, we, we all were about the same age. And we all kind of progressed at about the same pace. And uh, we stuck together for all those years. Uh, as I said, at the beginning, we took our knocks. And at the end, we were giving the knocks, which uh, makes, you know, changes your outlook on things. And uh, most of those players that I named, uh, they're actually in the Hall of Fame now. I think of the players I played with, the teammates, uh, at last count, I think there were 16 in the Hall of Fame. So that just shows just how talented the team was in those days. We used to have picnics in the, you know, in, uh, in the weekends and things. And uh, actually, the thing I remember too is like Carlings were our sponsor, uh, you know, the brewery. And in those days, I think the brewery sponsored every team in the league. And, uh, in the early days, as I mentioned to you, when we were taking our lumps, uh, if we won a game, the brewery arranged to have 
a case of beer dropped off at our house. I, I mean, they could never get away with that under the liquor laws now. But if we won, and as I said, we didn't win many games, but games we did win, they, I'd come home, I was like single in those days, living at home, and there would be a case of beer there delivered by the brewery, and they did that to everybody on the team. Well, a lot of the players uh, played sports in winter and summer. Like it was basically lacrosse in the summer and uh, soccer or basketball in, in the winter. And I played basketball in the winter time, so technically I was in shape all year round. It was just a case of conditioning yourself between, start with basketball where everything is, the court is short and everything is stop and go and short sprints. And lacrosse with a longer uh, air arena, floor space, you had to kind of adjust to uh, sprinting a little bit farther and, and that sort of thing. So it wasn't too much of a problem, but uh, we used to start early. We used to go into the gymnasiums and uh, you know do some calisthenics and that sort of stuff to kind of get warmed up. And uh, uh, a couple of times we actually used lacrosse sticks <coughs> and a sponge ball in, in the gyms knowing that you know, if you use the real lacrosse ball, you could do some damage to the school property. So we used lacrosse sticks and sponge balls and kind of run around and sh shot the ball around and that sort of thing. Well, I think it was very good. The arena wasn't too large, and uh, the fan support in those days was really good. And they, they supported us really well. We we're very successful on having the so-called home, home floor advantage in most games. And uh, what I found too was that the fans that go into the games, they were really fans, like not like the kinds of fans you see today. Uh, remembering, of course, that the availability of, of uh, watching sports in those days was limited, like the only hockey in town was the Canucks since some minor minor league and there was soccer of course which was in the off season so the fans that were lacrosse real lacrosse fans they used to go to two or three games a week like they'd go to Caresdale on Tuesday which was our games they'd go to uh, New Westminster on the Thursdays which was their games and uh, sometimes the, some of the fans would even travel to the island to, uh, when we played in Nanaimo which was on a weekend which made it possible for them to you know, uh, travel on the ferries and that sort of thing. Uh, in the 1962 series, which we played back east, uh, they, well, I should mention that the rules in those days allowed you to pick up players to strengthen. Like if you had an injured player that wasn't able to make the, make the game and it, rather than leaving a, a vacant spot in the team, you're allowed to pick up players from the other teams. But in our case, we didn't bother picking up everybody. We felt that you know, our team was strong enough as it was and that we could compete very well with the players that we stuck with all year round. As it turned out, we were really beating them badly. And uh, they ended up actually flooring a different team every time we played them like whereas the rule was you could have you know strengthen with three players uh, I think they changed the rule that let them split you know spread as many as they could so as it turned out every game we went to we didn't know who we were going to play like you know uh, there was probably a, a core players like you know uh, the team that wins of course uh, usually provides the most players but they just it was basically an all-star team we ended up playing every every game. Uh, well, I remember, I think that was the year that Don and Hamilton got a shutout. We were really uh, bonded together as a team, and uh, everybody worked hard. Uh, everybody was, what I would say, successful in what they were doing. I don't think the Brampton team was that strong, because I think we won four straight games, and none of the games were close. We used to have tougher series playing against New Westminster than we had playing against uh, the East. And I should add at that time that the West dominated lacrosse. Like if you look back at the statistics, 
uh, the Man Cup was won by the West far more often than the East. At, actually, at one time, when lacrosse was in its heyday, it was almost impossible for a visiting team to win. If the Eastern team traveled West, they lost. The Western team traveled East, we, they lost. But in our era, uh, all the Western teams were dominant. I just saw myself as uh, somebody that fit in with the group. Uh, we had no superstars in our days. There was superstars in the league, like Jack Bionda and Bobby Allen, and you, know, you can name a lot of the Eastern players. But in the West, uh, there were really no spectacular players like that. They were basically just hard, sound, basic lacrosse players. And I just tried to fit in with the group the same way, like work hard, uh, don't do dumb things when you're playing, and, uh, and just try to be a good teammate. I don't really know. I, uh, it just seemed natural for me to play left-handed or right-handed. And uh, as it turned out, like usually, if you're a left-handed player, you end up playing on the right side of the floor. And if you're a left-handed, right-handed player, you're playing on the left-hand side of the floor. And uh, when I first started out, uh, we shifted the lines around a little bit. And uh, like this was in junior. And so I ended up, I'm, I feel I'm really a left-hander, but I ended up playing the whole year right-handed. And as it turned out, I was able to continue playing adequately on both sides. And my theory was simple, and that was that uh, if you want to score goals, you have to have your stick on the goalie side. And uh, if you're a, a right-hander uh, playing on the, left si or on the right side, then the angles of shooting, of course, benefit the goalie, not the shooter. So the situation was I tried to take advantage of that, and uh, I would just uh, you know, if I was on the right side, I'd play left-handed. If I was on the left side, I would play right-handed. When you're playing defense, of course, you always like to have your webbing on top of the webbing of the opponent so that uh, you can, you know, block the shots and that sort of thing. So if you're being checked by somebody with the webbing away from you, in other words, their butt end, uh, yeah, you, you have an advantage. So uh, I, I tried to use that as an excuse. To, you know, to try and score goals. Like uh, if uh, the defender had a, a left-handed defender was playing, then I would play left-handed against him. So his stick was never on top of mine. In 64, we had a tough, tough series with New Westminster. Like it was always a knock him down, drag him out battle. And n none of the games are ever sweeps. Like, a couple of mistakes could change the whole outcome of the game. A couple of breaks could change the outcome of the game. A couple of bad calls from the referee could change the outcome of the game. And the games went basically right down to the last minute. And sometimes it was uh, the last shot that won it, or the last shot lost, lost it. And so by the time we battled through, I think we played the whole seven se game series against New Westminster in that year. And as it turned out, the I think the last game we played was on like a Friday night, and the first game of the Man Cup was scheduled for Monday night in the East. So that was fine. We traveled to the East, and uh, first game we went out there, uh, we lost, and we felt that, well, it was appropriate basically because we had a tough series at New Westminster. We had no time to recover. Uh, we traveled, uh, had had no time to practice, and uh, it was kind of a carryover. We uh, just didn't seem to get our game clicking. So when we lost, we kind of accepted the fact that we had a pretty good excuse as to why we lost. So the second game we played, we played better than the first game, but it wasn't good enough to win. We still ended up losing by four or five goals. I can't remember the scores of the game, but, uh, but we played a lot better. You know, it was encouraging that we played. And then when the third game came around, we were on a high. We ended up beating the team. And uh, we said to ourselves, finally, we're playing at the level that we're capable of playing. We're playing the lacrosse that, that uh, allowed us to be Western champions. 
and uh, we demonstrated the play like the players demonstrated their abilities and their teamwork and we felt really good about winning winning that game so now the series is like two games to one the fourth game uh, we went out very very confident but we ended up losing I can't remember the scores again but uh, it was kind of a, a disappointing game like uh, we thought we were on a high on a good roll and we're totally unsuccessful so now the series was sitting at three games to one and uh, we were moping around like we used to stay in a motel close to the arena and uh, you know we talk about it and say you know we, we really got to do something so when we went to play the fifth game we got there a little bit early and we noticed that there was a a van or a station wagon station wagon that's what it was was parked by the entrance to the dressing rooms and there were two or three people carrying in boxes like cardboard boxes as it turned out those cardboard boxes were boxes of champagne and so with the series three to one in their favor they had brought the champagne in to the dressing room to celebrate and so when our guys saw what was going on this really inspired us to say well you know here's their chance to spoil a good party so we went out and we won the game so now the series is three to two and the sixth game came along it was kind of a repeat of what happened in the, f the fifth game we got the arena same station wagon was there same guys carrying the boxes of, of champagne into the dressing room ready to celebrate winning the man cup so again we looked at each other and we said you know this we can't let this happen we've got to you know we got to be on our toes we've got to play our best game we got to play the way we're capable of playing so luckily enough it was a close game we ended up winning uh, so now the series is tied six uh, three three seventh game same situation the same people the same station wagon and I assume it's the same champagne they kept bringing you back back and forth of the game and uh, in that game we just dominated it like uh, it was the kind of uh, outcome that we kind of felt that should have we should have had earlier in the series and uh, as it turned out we dug ourselves into a hole in the first period in that particular game I remember that but we just battled away and battled away and uh, finally we ended up uh, uh, winning it so it was uh, an accomplishment like everybody dug in deep everybody put out what they had and uh, and it was really something that we were really proud of that we were able to accomplish especially again winning in the in the east because that was a tough situation Nanaimo in those days they didn't really have a minor system or some they imported all their players and they imported most of the Peterborough Timberman players like uh, Ashby and uh, 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 Dugan uh, they they brought them in and so technically and it's kind of unusual too like the team in uh, Peterborough were called the Timberman and the team in Nanaimo were called the Timberman so really the players that came over they played for a different team but with the same uh, same name so they actually stacked the team and and they were potentially winners all the time they they very seldom lost because they had really really top-notch talent and uh, as it turned out as long as they were winning games the fans were supporting them but when they started losing games they lost fan support and so eventually they uh, kind of gave up the franchise but as it turned out the franchise in Nanaimo was uh, taken over by Coquitlam so uh, Coquitlam just had built a new arena and uh, so it turned out really well they uh, we started with a team uh, like first of all uh, the problem of course was getting players and none of the teams wanted to give up players because uh, you know you're ending up breaking up them uh, uh, the harmony that exists on teams but as it turned out a lot of the players that were marginal or just kind of on on the um, protected list or whatever it is uh, ended up coming to Coquitlam so we had a, a mixture of players from uh, New Westminster from Vancouver and in those days there were a few players that played on the island that were mainland kids 
So, you know, the island gave up those players, and so we ended up with uh, kind of a hodgepodge of, of individuals. And uh, as it turned out, it was the same kind of thing. Uh, we weren't really a good team, but we weren't really a bad team either. When we played against New Westminster, the kids that came from New Westminster just like they really didn't show up for the game, if you know what I mean. And same with Vancouver. When we played Vancouver, the kids that came from Vancouver, they didn't show up for each game. So what's happening, of course, is you're kind of playing with half a team, depending on who the opposition was. But as it turned out, of course, we ended up third. Like Victoria uh, were the bottom place team in those days. So we ended up third. And, and, uh, and I think in that first year, we ended up beating Vancouver in the, in the uh, semifinals, which was a surprise because, you know, they were defending champion, Man Cup champions. And uh, we ended up losing to New Westminster in the finals. My ambition was to be a coach. Like, lacrosse was in my blood. I didn't want to be in a situation where when I finished playing, I was done with the game sort of thing. I wanted to keep involved. But I also wanted to keep involved in playing. I didn't want to give up playing. And uh, I could see the writing on the wall in Vancouver that we had spectacular players there, like Bobby Marsh, Alec, Alec McKay, uh, and uh, you know these were potential coaches for the team. And so I kind of saw that you know I'd be fourth or fifth in line if they ever decided to pick, pick a, a next player to play uh, to it. So when the opportunity came to Coquitlam, uh, it was a big decision on my part. I had to decide to leave all the f guys that I'd sweat blood with for all those years to start somewhere somewhere new. And uh, but anyhow, I made the decision. And Coquitlam, because they're so desperate for players and things, that they said that if they didn't get the people they wanted, they weren't going to continue the franchise. And so I happened to be one of the, piece in the pieces that they wanted. So that's basically it. It was, uh, as it turned out, uh, it wasn't ended up being my choice. It was a case of me being shipped there. Yeah, actually, I, when I was in Coquitlam, I was, I was coaching and playing at the same time because, as I said, I wanted to coach and I wanted to play, and the only way I could do it was to do both at the same time. So that worked out good for me, personally. And, uh, I didn't ever have any serious injuries. I used to have a lot of stitches, of course, like everybody. Like, you always get, those were the days before you had helmets and things, and you used to get hit in the head, and you had to shave your head to get the stitches into your scalp and that sort of thing. And, uh, but in terms of uh, major injuries, uh, not, none, none to speak of. I played there for four years, and then I, my last year, I coached but didn't play. And uh, that would be 1969, I guess. And uh, that was after I left. Uh, Bobby Marsh came from Vancouver to, to coach them. And uh, so that really, my involvement with them was really strong in the first five years because of my personal involvement. And it just tapered off. Like, uh, I w tried to stay away from the game because it was still in my blood. And I didn't want to get all enthusiastic about it. And uh, I kind of avoided things as much as I could. Well, in 1954, I believe, uh, they were trying to revive the field lacrosse game. So we had an exhibition game between Vancouver and New Westminster, played at Callister Park. I don't know if you remember Callister Park. And uh, again, they were trying to revive the game. And we'd never played field lacrosse. Like, we didn't. Half the players didn't even know the rules. All you had to remember was that you're going to have so many offensive players and so many defensive players. And you saw this great big goal, six by six, compared to the small ones that we were used to. So we, and, and I'm sure it was 1954 because the bank, I think it was the Indians, the North Shore Indians at that time. So uh, it was 
their player, senior players and the, some Vancouver senior players and some junior call-ups. Like I ended up, because I was a junior age in those days and we ended up playing uh, with that team. And, and I imagine New Westminster did the same thing. They had their senior team augmented with uh, call-ups from their juniors. And so we played at Callister Park and uh, successfully we won the game. I can't remember the score or anything, but I don't know whether or not it was uh, how well it was accepted, but again, it was a case of trying to uh, encourage the game to start. And then once again, back in 1967, and the reason I remember that is I just saw a little flag with that date on it, the Australian field lacrosse team was on its way to England for the World Championships. And uh, they stopped here to play us an play an exhibition game. So we picked a uh, all-star team from the players, between New Westminster, Coquitlam, and Vancouver. And uh, at Queen's Park, I believe, we, uh, we ended up playing against the Australian uh, national team. And actually, we won. We won the game against them. And this is surprising because we weren't, lacrosse, we weren't field lacrosse players. We were box lacrosse players. And there's a big difference in the, in the game. And as it turned out, uh, Australia were very successful in the world tournament. I think they ended up second and uh, even ahead of Canada. And here we were a bunch of uh, raggy tags uh, playing against virtually a, a select field across team and, and beating them. Um, nothing special. Uh, sometimes I kind of regret not playing longer because I was, wasn't, didn't leave because of injuries. You know, I just kind of left on my own accord. And I kind of felt that when I look back at things that, you know, I only played 12 years in that league. And I thought, well, maybe I could have lasted another year or two. And that, that was probably the only thing. Biggest regret, I think, though, is the fact that moving from Vancouver to Coquitlam. Uh, I look back and uh, even though it worked out well for me, deep in my mind, the loyalty factor kicks in. And uh, you find that even though you enjoyed what you were doing, leaving all your teammates behind, and now they, they become the enemy, if you know what I mean, then that, that, was, that was hard. And uh, so I always regretted maybe I should have stayed in Vancouver and, uh, and just ran out my career there. But, but other than that, that was about it.